Thomas Hill's rendition of the Battle of the Bulge and of his stay in Stalag 9B in that order of Germany. On approximately December 15, 1944, the four of us up on the front line, which is better known as the Siegfried Line, where the Germans had a lot of pillboxes and things like that. The four of us would never go into pillboxes. Nine out of ten times, they had had them hooked up, so if you walked in them, the way they would go, they'd just blow up. So naturally, we stayed out of them. And we'd always get kind of close to them because there was some protection because sometimes the German artillery was coming in on us. So, on December, on December 15th, 1944, quite late in the afternoon, we retired for the night. I always stayed about 30 yards from where the forward observer was to his left. We had three lines open. My job was to keep two of the lines open between a halfway point between infantry and artillery with a third line, which he used all, at all times. But once it got dark out, with no communications between infantry and artillery, the reason is you'd be giving away your position. So all during the night that night, gosh, it was an awful lot of artillery fire. Just about all of the German. We did not know it at the time, but they were knocking out the 106th artillery. So we're all waiting for morning to come so we could call back in, find out what's coming off. Because naturally we couldn't see a doggone thing and we're dug in up here. So anyhow, about approximately 8 o'clock the next morning, it started to get a touch light out anyhow. And every morning at that time, either me or Joe Gore would go over and get some coffee or roads, whatever they had, over in an infantry tent where you could go, which is two to three blocks away from where we were located at. So anyhow, we're standing, me and Gore were standing there talking which one of us, whose turn it was, naturally, to go over and get it. So just about this time, boy, it's a racket, just a terrible racket. So anyhow, I get up and I look, oh my God. There were German tanks coming towards us from all at the first time I seen them, they were Oh, I would say a block and a half away. Man, they just kept on coming and coming. I would say approximately, oh, maybe 60, 70, 80 tanks over, spread out over about three blocks, maybe four blocks could be. Now, everybody says they talk about the Tiger tanks. Only about one third of these were Tiger tanks. Most of them were the small tanks, much more maneuverable than the Tiger tanks were, but they just kept on coming. Well, we had no choice but just to get down where we were at. We could not do it. So the tanks approached us, you know, I would say approximately five minutes, they were on us. They kept on coming by for, oh, maybe, I would say 20 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. It seemed much longer, but that's all it was. 15 to 20 minutes. Now, at this point, we felt all the bias. So anyhow, we did get up. The German artillery was following them. They were coming up all oh, approximately a block and a half, two blocks behind them. So as we watched them, we, again, we're, we're sunk. We're just in here. There's uh, just the four of us. And we, uh, we're up for about maybe three-quarters of a block ahead of the infantry, because we're fire direction. We're the ones who are calling back and tell on our howitzers which way to shoot. So anyhow, there we were. But they only came maybe about another hundred yards, and they quit. Then they moved back. Then they moved over about a block to my left. Again, they come on very strong this time, very, very, very strong. What they'd done, they split us in half. Then, again, they moved back and came forward again and split us again. In other words, they had us in four sections. So Winston, pretty smart fellow, says, come on, let's get the hell out of here. So anyhow, we moved left. 
I would say we just took off what we've done. And we did after going maybe four, five, six blocks, went into about 150, some mixed, the 28th Division, and took the 106th Division. So we joined them. We kept on, we kept on going, and we ran into approximately, I would say, another 150, about, we were about 300 strong. But this time it was a Colonel Thompson, who seemed to be the head of the works, and two majors. So what they'd done, they got up and they started talking, especially Thompson. His men, just follow me. I think we can get to Bastogne, where I'm sure they'll be able to hold out. So we did. We took off, we followed him. They didn't even go 20 to 30 yards. They hit a mine. It was Colonel Thompson, two majors, and a driver in a Jeep. They hit a mine. They were going with the kingdom. Come, my God, off. They would have been killed immediately. When they went over a mine like that, the Jeep flew about six feet into the air. The wheels flew off of it, and when they come down, if nothing else got them, I guess the combustion had killed them. But anyhow, then the highest ranking officer that we had among us was a captain. He told us, well, John, we're just going to see if we just can't keep on going the same way. But no jeeps. They would keep off the road entirely. We would walk on the side. Again, we took off. And all of a sudden, a terrific amount of artillery started coming in on us. We couldn't even tell from where it came, but it really came in two directions. One was to, a little bit to, to the left of where we were, and one back of us. This is where I got hit. I got hit in the left left hand, my thumb was almost taken off. And I got 18 stitches later on, put in my left ankle. Plus, my neck stung like a son of a gun, so I just zoomed. I was also hit in the neck. Anyhow, it was coming towards dark at this time. So anyhow, we all dug in again. Gee, and I, I really felt lousy. Well, all, so many falls had been hit by this time also from the artillery. Most of it was aerial burst where the bombs would go off all about ah, 10, 12 feet above you. So anyhow, we woke up the next morning and we continued on. One thing I'm very thankful for, I was with friends. And they helped me, so I couldn't walk a little bit anyhow. So we kept on, and again, we ran into a German pocket, I would say, of about a hundred. Again, there was a battle there. They backed off. Again, we took off. And uh, now we were marching, I would say, maybe a day and a half, something like that. But we did run across. The 200 that were mowed down by the Germans. What happened? What happened there, though, was now, these fellows were all wounded, practically all of them, and the Germans were on the move. Naturally, the Germans could not take them with them, being on the move. They could not return them back because they had to keep on going along with the tanks. Really, I guess it came down to it. They had no alternative either. So, anyhow, what they done? They started marching them, and they marched them into a field. And in this field were four or five trucks, German trucks. Inside these trucks are machine guns. When they got them all in the center, they just let down a tailgate and killed every damn American there. Approximately 200. We've seen this, but I can say this also. We were not the first ones there. The others have been there before us because they had no dog tags on it. All dog tags had been taken off, but there was nobody alive either. Started and took off again. And it became nighttime again, so we just dug in. The next morning again, we took off and started marching. I don't think anybody knew where they were marching to, to tell the truth. The captain who had us he was a young fellow, probably 22, 23. Kingston was his name. He didn't know where we were going. I know. Now I know what I didn't know it in the course of the time. Oh, so anyhow, 
After marching about approximately five or six hours, we sat down to rest. More German artillery came in on us. We could not figure out even where it was coming from. Well, anyhow, we dug in again where we were at. After about a half hour, everything went quiet again. So we got up and we started marching. Again, we ran into the damn entrance, German infantry. Another battle took place. Now, it took its toll because at this time, I know there was about 300 of us. Three days before this, I know there was only uh, maybe 150, 175, something like that. Last how many were killed, how many were wounded, I do not know. Anyhow, nighttime set in again. We dug in again. And at this time, I would say 75% of us were wounded. We they hit with artillery some way or another. So the next morning when we woke up, approximately, I would say 100 yards behind us, there was four tanks. The other side of us, but in front of us, about 75 to 100 yards. There was four more tanks. When it got nice and light, Three men came down, all carrying white flags. Spoke to the captain and said, do you want to die or do you want to surrender? It's up to you. Frankly, we had nothing left. We had no, no shells or no mortar shells or anything like that. We, excuse me. We were, we were done for. So anyhow, we decided. The cap, we didn't, I wasn't one of decided. The captain, he decided, okay. To surrender. When you surrender, anything else you have, you just got to give to them, which we did. And again, they started marching us. We ended up in a field where there was approximately, I would say, three to four hundred more GIs. Some 20th Division, some 106th Infantry Division. There was an anti-tank division, uh, part of an anti-tank division there. And again, I would say, man, maybe 25, 50% are wounded. Everybody seems to be bleeding some way or another. So anyhow, they kept us in a big field all night. Then we started out the next morning. We marched from approximately 8 o'clock to 2 o'clock the following morning. Naturally, every couple hours, we did stop and we did rest. But by this time, now if you drop out, by the way, they kill you. It's all over. So we just kept on marching. And as I say, if I didn't have friends with me, there was no way I could have possibly made it. So anyhow, we ended up in a great big field at 2 in the morning. The temperature at this time, I would say maybe 20 above, something like that. Because we all laid down on the ground. What you do, you lay down on the ground, and one man would get on top of you. You all huddle up real close together. Try then. You're so exhausted, you do fall asleep. For maybe, oh, half hour, 45 minutes, hour, maybe. And you change position. You'd be on the bottom, they'd be on the top. You'd done this for, oh, maybe six, seven hours until it got light out. But we all, everybody there, that frozen feet, frozen hands, fingers, I would say. It has my feet in your, in your fingers, all the skin, just, you can just peel it right off after a couple of days. But anyhow, they did load us on boxcars. 66 men to a car. These boxcars are about half the size of our cars. Now remember, there's no latrine, there's nothing on these over in the corners where you get rid of everything. 66 men, spend your time one hour down, one hour up, one hour down, one hour up. It's almost impossible to lay down. But that's the way we were for nine days. Just around here, they, we did stop at maybe, I would say five different prison camps, but they're all filled. No place for us. So we just kept on and on and on. And we were in Frankfurt. Then we moved out of Frankfurt, just a very, very short distance, which I'm pretty sure was Hanau. Terrifically big railroad yards. And 
was just becoming dusk. It's getting dark, and all of a sudden, some mosquito bombers came over and dropped some flares. Boy, after that, your uh, RAF came over there with the bombers, and they just bombed the hell out of Hanau, the railroad yards. They had some direct hits on our cars. They were, they'd done it for, oh, I would say, 10 minutes, maybe. Then they left. They'd gotten maybe four or five direct hits on certain cars. All you'd done is dig great big holes and shovel in, take the dog tags off, what was left. Anyhow, I got back into cars. We went back into Frankfurt. Oh, well, we went down another side track. And at the end of the side track, I did see a big sign that said B A D O R B something. Bad orb. Here, he got us all off the cars. I was well, practically being carried off. A lot of them were the same, same, same way as myself. So anyhow, this is why I found out all the Germans knew what son of a bitch meant because all they kept on doing is calling us son of a bitches. They kept on and on and on. Then they started stoning me, throwing rocks at us, bricks. We started marching. We were told by the guards we got to go about nine miles and it's all up. Remember, if you drop out, you're dead. So as I say, I had friends with me. We finally, finally did get to Stellog 9B which was about approximately nine to 10 miles above that orb. When we got into camp, it did put us in some barracks where we could rest. After resting, he gave everybody an old German canteen. I would say it was probably from World War I. And he gave you two potatoes and some greens. I do not know what kind of greens they were, but Naturally, you ate them like if they were turkey. Then they started interrogating us. What's your name? What's your rank? What outfit you're with? Where did you come from? Naturally, you are told to give nothing but your name, rank, and serial number, which I done, which a number of others did too. Us, they put out to stand out in the cold for about five hours. Anybody who take told them any information they wanted, they stayed in the barracks. We should have, but like fools, we gave name rank Syrian normal only. So after about five hours, a captain come out and says, fellas, tell them what they want to know and come on back in the barracks. Big deal. But anyhow, we did, and we got back into the barracks again. Then each day, while you are there, you get one piece of bread, you get one bowl of potatoes called potato soup. It'd be more or less potato peeling soup. But it was something anyhow. Then after about, I would say, a week to two weeks, they separated all Jews from us. And none of these Jews were ever heard from again. There was, I would say, guessing roughly 30 to 40 of them. Nobody ever heard from them again. So, and yeah, this is the way it just went for, for about oh, a little over four months, I guess. Every day you'd get that one bowl of soup and that one piece of bread. We could not work. Those are very, very few that could work. Those that could work, they'd take out, work on railroads, but just the majority of us just had to stay in camp, that's all. And of course, there is no latrine or washroom, whatever you want to call it. There's a hole in the corner where everybody goes there. And naturally, everybody got dysentery. We lost weight. I, I, just, I just couldn't believe. I know after about four months, I weighed in the neighborhood of 110, 115 pounds, probably. Though, and there's an awful lot of fellows that died, though. They get infections. See, they had nothing to give us to kill an infection. So if you got a bad infection, that was it. So while we're in, I'll just give a couple of the high spots. After uh, approximately six, seven, eight weeks, 
two men they used to keep in the kitchen. The Germans kept two old men in the kitchen. This morning they're dead. They were killed. So, anyhow, they haul all of us out. Have a six abreast. The commandant of the camp who asked, who done it? Nobody said, he took six men, put them out, bang, go down they went. He machine got them down. I was fourth, I was in the fourth line. I guess I'm not a hero because I'd already said about four our fathers and four Hail Marys. Anyhow, he took six more, then a chaplain. I do not know I don't know what religion he was from. And he asked for just a few minutes with the men. But the commandant gave him. He talked to one man and said he was looking for a certain person in his barracks who was not there. So he went over and he talked to this man. And the man confessed. Him and two other fellows who got out of their barracks, went over to the kitchen and killed the two guards. For what reason? Who knows? Because there was nothing there for them. So they put them up right before, right before just put them up, boom, down they went. That's the end of that. And it was just, by the way, this was a Russian camp. I should have told you, the Russians had to go out every morning and work. If they could not work, they killed them. No matter what, no, there was no, there was no such thing as sickness, no excuses. Where the Russians were concerned, you either work or you die, one thing or the other. With us, if you could not work, they would leave you in the barracks. They did not kill you. So this is the way it went, you know, uh, while we were in there. And another high point, I would say, middle of January or the end of January, a bunch of mosquito bombers. Now, Frank was 40 miles away. Went over Frankfurt, dropped flares all over the place. This took place maybe 9, 10 o'clock at night. Then, I would say a steady, oh, 20 minutes to a half hour, the heavy bombers came over. They bombing 40 miles away in the hills that we were on were just shim, trembling, shaking. It was almost impossible to believe. All you had seen was great big flashes way off in the distance, 40 miles away. And then the barracks would just rock back and forth, back and forth. I don't know anybody lived underneath anything like that, but evidently they did. So oh, that uh, was another thing. Oh, boy, it's pretty hard. To, you got, so anyhow, men are dying at the rate, I would say now, four a day, five a day, something like that. See, once you get this dysentery, you lose everything. You just go and you ain't going no more, then you lay down and you just pass away. So it was, oh, maybe two weeks before we were liberated. This night we're there. And we look out, we can see lights from a long distance away. But they are, there are trucks, all right. Maybe 10 miles away, 15 miles away, I don't know. Or we could see them which gave us some kind of hope. You see, if you got some hope, you can go a little bit longer. So anyhow, the next three or four nights, right in a row, we're watching. The next three or four nights in a row, we were watching these trucks, and they were coming closer. There was no question about that. So then on the, I would, let's say it's the fourth or the fifth night, I thought I heard something outside. It was pretty, pretty noisy, but when you looked out, you couldn't see anything. So, anyhow, but the next morning, there's a white flag on our camp. And we found out we have been liberated. There was no guards guarding us. Finally, we're, we were alongside of the Autobahn, I would say, maybe uh, four to five blocks above the Autobahn where this camp was located. So, there they saw some big tanks come tearing, there were our Sherman tanks come tearing in, knocked down the gates, and poured into our camp. We have been liberated, my God, how wonderful. Just how wonderful it was. 
But just before we were liberated, three days it was before that, when the Germans, a German tank battalion was moving up the Autobahn below us there, and some of our planes did spot them. And for about two hours, they did give them just one bad time. But we, we felt that they'd come up and kill all of us. They won't leave us away with that, but they didn't. So anyhow, from here, we were flown in to Camp Lucky Strike in France, where immediately they deloused us. They filled up portable tanks, and we took showers, and they kept on spraying us, and showers, and sprays, and, and sprays. You see, everybody at this time had lice. When you took off your clothes, you looked like you were pregnant. Your stomach was out, your chest was in, and you had sores all over your body. You were loaded with lice. It was quite a horrible experience, but I did survive. I would say maybe, maybe one-third of us survived the ordeal. The others all died. But I often thank God for it. Yeah, that is my life. For the battle of the, battle of the Bulge and Stella, 90, Bad Orb, Germany.